Hallo und willkommen zu unserer heutigen Podcast-Ausgabe. Mein Name ist Marcel Engel und ich leite die Geschäftsstelle des Deutschen Global Compact Netzwerkes. Heute geht es um das Thema Zukunftsszenarien. Die Zukunftsforschung ist gerade für Unternehmen von großer Bedeutung mit Blick auf die Umsetzung der Agenda 2030, denn nachhaltige Geschäftsmodelle sind nicht von heute auf morgen realisierbar. Deshalb braucht es Zukunftsentwürfe, an denen Unternehmen ihre Planung orientieren können. Hierbei spricht man von sogenannter Corporate Foresight. Dabei wird unser Wissen über die Welt von morgen in künftige Produkt- bzw. Investitionsoptionen übersetzt. Langjährige Erfahrung mit dem Thema hat das World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Mein heutiger Gesprächspartner ist Filippo Veglio, Managing Director beim World Business Council und verantwortlich für eine aktuelle Studie, über die wir heute sprechen wollen. The 2020-2030 Operating Environment stellt sich die Frage, welche Megatrends und Disruptionen uns in den kommenden zehn Jahren erwarten. Der Studienzeitraum passt zu den UN-Entwicklungszielen der Agenda 2030, ist aber Bestandteil des längerfristigen Zukunftsszenarios des World Business Council, der sogenannten Vision 2050, in welcher der Frage nachgegangen wird, wie über 10 Milliarden Menschen ein gutes Leben innerhalb der planetarischen Grenzen bis Mitte dieses Jahrhunderts ermöglicht werden kann. Dabei wurden keine Kristallkugeln verwendet. Der World Business Council kann natürlich nicht vorhersagen, wie die Zukunft im Einzelnen aussehen wird. Vielmehr geht es darum, so gut wie möglich die zugrunde liegenden Kräfte zu verstehen, die die entstehende Zukunft formen und wie diese wahrscheinlich miteinander interagieren werden. Die Antwort darauf hängt ganz entscheidend von der Wirtschaft ab. Unternehmen haben beträchtliche Möglichkeiten, die Zukunft zu gestalten, aber zugleich gibt es Ereignisse wie etwa die aktuelle Covid-19-Pandemie, die erheblichen Einfluss haben. Zentral ist, wie wir auf diese Kräfte reagieren. Lassen wir uns durch Gegen- und Seitenwind, auf den wir nicht vorbereitet sind, vom Kurs abbringen? Oder können wir Strategien entwickeln, die uns resilienter und widerstandsfähiger gegenüber solchen vorhersehbaren Überraschungen machen? Filippo Veglio und sein Team beim World Business Council sind sich sicher. Obwohl Covid-19 kurzfristig alles ändern wird, bleiben die 2020er Jahre eine Make-or-Break-Dekade für Vision 2050 und für die nachhaltigen Entwicklungsziele der Vereinten Nationen. Reichlich Gesprächsstoff also für mein Interview mit Filippo Veglio, das wir auf Englisch führen werden. Filippo, uh, many thanks for taking time out of your extremely busy agenda for this interview today. As, uh, as uh, previously mentioned, our intention is uh, in particular to talk about the Vision 2050 of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and about the revision that you are currently doing of uh, Vision 2050. So perhaps let me start with one, one question. I mean, you first, you had the first draft of Vision 2050, I think it was in the year 2010 and now uh, almost 10 years later uh, you are deciding to review it but 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 to start with a, a very blunt question um, a former chancellor german chancellor once said that people that are having visions should go and see the doctor so why do we need a vision and why do we need a vision from business thank you marcel thank you so much for having me a pleasure to um, interact with you and of course Uh, always a pleasure to be able to share some perspectives of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, your question kicks off our discussion in quite a, a provocative way. But I think, uh, yes, of course, I, I have heard that um, saying before, you know, it's, it's dangerous to have visions and you should go see a doctor. At the same time, we also know another uh, motto, another uh, saying that says, you know, vision without action is just a dream. That's definitely true. But action without a vision just will kill some time, will just pass time. And so what is the overall vision that the business community has with regard to the sustainability agenda? What is the vision with regard to what sustainability means for society, but also with regard to the implications for the business community in terms of uh, opportunities, in terms of responsibilities, but more widely also in terms of the role that businesses of all sizes have to contribute to this important agenda is why uh, we are re-embarking on this exercise. As you say, it's a decade um, ago that we came up with it. And I think undoubtedly, as we all know, uh, there have been uh, quite a lot of ups and downs, as there always is across a decade of time, including uh, positive ones, but also uh, some worrying ones. And we thought the time was right 
uh, to really kick off the 2020s with a refreshed vision, taking into account political changes, geopolitical uh, changes, take, taking into account uh, technology, the development of technology, the, the incredible development of technology just with a decade ago, taking into account also the increased role of science and the, the knowledge that we have about sustainability. And last but not least, taking into account the idea that we really are entering an era where we must transform major economic systems. So really incrementalism is no longer uh, enough and nice to have and nice agendas are not enough anymore. How do you really set an ambitious and transformative agenda that aligns with sustainable development goals? That's the main reason then that we decided let's land this again, let's make it actionable, let's align with sustainable development goals and uh, rally companies around it. Thank you. Very interesting. Perhaps can, can you perhaps expand on some of the key questions you were yes. trying to answer um, in the vision? With the vision. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, first and foremost is uh, how do you look at the 2020s as really an era of transformation? Uh, we have defined the era 2010 to 2020 as uh, the so-called turbulent teens. So a lot of years in which um, this agenda was up for grabs in terms of who will pay for what. How do you lay the major frameworks uh, to agree on the direction uh, of travel? And we've seen that with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. But we have also seen a lot of turbulence. I think uh, even earlier than 2010, the, the financial crisis and the resulting economic crisis has created, and that's a euphemism, uh, created, um, uh, let's say, turbulence uh, all across societies, turbulence in the economy, turbulence also with regard to trust, transition from turbulence uh, to transition is one of the key um, from turbulence to transformation, excuse me, how do you transition? That is one of the fundamental uh, questions. We have then within transformation, the question is what are the key economic systems that need to transform? Uh, think of food, think of energy, think of mobility, think of the wider, um, uh, let's say the social agenda, how are we really to ensure uh, dignity, uh, the, the famous leave no one behind agenda, the inclusion agenda, the human rights agenda, how do you bring it on board? How do you also bring on board uh, the areas that would be called the living spaces? How can businesses uh, bring about solutions, uh, innovations, and um, um, practical approaches uh, to those issues? Water and sanitation, uh, urban infrastructure, connectivity, finance, a number of these questions really that need to be transformed in order to really accelerate action uh, in line with the sustainable development goals. Perhaps. Um Coming back uh, to to Vision 2050 and the revision yeah. of 2050, um, the WBCST also states uh, uh, that 2020 is a super year for sustainability. Yeah. Isn't it rather the contrary? It, what would be the contrary? Explain me. The contrary, uh, exactly. The contrary would be that it is not a good year for sustainability because we have a major recession coming up front. No, okay. No, of course. I, I think, look, we, uh, we are uh, adapting to the reality. I think just uh, very briefly for background uh, to our uh, listeners and, and to our audience, uh, 2020 was setting out some major milestones, in particular on the nature agenda. Uh, and on the climate agenda. And there were some ambitious timelines to get to the, to the respective COPs, the conferences of the parties at the end of the year, with some really good, uh, not only uh, milestones set up, but really commitments uh, going forward. If you think of the Paris Agreement five years on, on the Convention on Biological Diversity, diversity a lot more interested also by the business community. So we named it, we framed it a little bit as a super year, thinking it's very important to engage with policymakers to present the view that business wants to be uh, part of the solution and only be perceived as part of the uh, problem. Yes, of course, the super year uh, in that regard with our, let's say, um, our glasses of sustainability on is slightly changed. But I think the urgency in and of itself has not changed. Of course, the, the timelines have shifted, everything moves out to 2021. Uh, uh, which sounds crazy, but really it's really shifting a, a year on. Our own council meeting moves also a year uh, on. So I think everybody's sort of everybody's shifting and adapting. But the urgency of the sustainability agenda, in and of itself, I would argue, I would argue very personally, Marcel, is actually we see a lot more interest and uptake, even in this discussion on Vision 2050, which, as you said, you know, you should be careful not to have visions or go to the doctor. But I think it has been much easier over the last few months to position a long-term outlook uh, in front of people, to go beyond the day-to-day, -day, which we all know, you know, through the media is always dominated by one or two news cycles, 
and to start thinking, well, okay, if this happened, what are some of the other issues that are out there on the agenda? What are some of the issues that we actually know will be there, including climate, water, and a number of other issues that are sustainability related? And how are we going to not only adapt, but actually try to thrive by innovating, by reacting, and by developing uh, new business models around it? So it's been a little bit of a, of a, of course, from a political point of view and timeline point of view, a total uh, sort of a flattening. But we see in, in, on the positive end with the glass half full, the idea of, hey, actually, this kind of stuff that you're working on is actually helpful to help us in the planning, in the strategy development, because right now there is a lot of uncertainty and trying to feed into that debate um, fueled by uncertainty has certainly been a, a different angle and an interesting angle for WB system. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Um, perhaps uh, now moving a little bit into uh, the more concrete findings yeah. uh, of, uh, of, of, of the revision of 20, yeah. Vision 2015, perhaps, especially focusing on the operating environment 2030, 2020, 2030. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps two two questions in the, in in that context to start with before we we talk about individual macro trends and disruptions. Yeah. Um, to start with, um, what's the difference between the study you have done on the operating environment uh, for the next decade um, and the global risk report that is uh, uh, annually published by the World Economic Forum? And how, perhaps connected with, I don't know, and how does this, this study of the next decade fit into the overall vision 2050? Okay. Uh, so first part of the question, thank you, Marcel. I think it's, it's an excellent question in terms of the, the World Economic Forum. As you know, every January uh, publishing this uh, risk, I would call it almost like a risk uh, radar at that moment. What is on the radar of business leaders, of policymakers, uh, with regard to the risks in terms of uh, likelihood and in terms of uh, impact. So an excellent work uh, and every year. I think it's one of the most accessed resources by our colleagues in WEF and, and certainly also from our side, it has been incredibly useful to try to frame some of the discussions. Interestingly, this year, as you know, a handful, the, the handful of top risks uh, has actually been, is actually positioned around the environmental agenda. So also there you see that risk is um, materialized also in the form of sustainability uh, elements. So I would think that is a, a work of, of surveying, a work of uh, analysis, and a work of sort of uh, teasing out where is the thinking heading with regard to perceptions of risk in terms of likelihood and impact. Our work on uh, trends, on macro trends and disruptions, Marcel, is more framed around an analysis of we know, and let me use maybe a, a figure of speech uh, that my colleague Julian Hillando always uses very well. He says, the macro trends, you have to think of them almost like a river. You know, any river right now, a major river, let's say River Rhine or whatever major river we have across the world, we know the direction of travel of that river. We know that it will land in the sea. We know where it starts. We know where it ends. More or less uh, subject a few extreme weather events, there will be no major disruption, but that river will flow and we know where some of these things uh, are heading. And I'll come back to those trends. The disruptions that we built into it then was more a figure of speech around the volcano. You know that a volcano is there, you're monitoring volcanoes all over the world, There's some better, some worse, some are surprising you because they might erupt without uh, us being uh, aware of it. Some others you are monitoring very closely because you know it's, it's getting, you know, maybe a little bit more tricky. So using that river and uh, volcano analogy, we basically said, what are some of the, uh, and I think we landed on, uh, now I have a blank, uh, we landed on a dozen macro trends uh, that were saying, you know, that's sort of the river. We know where democracy is going. We know where the economy is going. We know that environmental issues. Uh, technology, we don't know everything about technology, but we know it's impacting. Uh, politics and geopolitics, big picture, you know more or less that these things are starting to get baked in into that next decade. On the side of disruption, of course, you have different uh, elements. You have an element like a pandemic, as I mentioned before. Is it a volcano that you're monitoring? And that actually scientists have been warning us about for years. If you go back in some of the literature now, uh, as many have done, basically everybody's saying, well, we have warned you and nobody was just listening. Nobody was listening. That's the problem. Uh, are we actually listening about technology, the role of technology nowadays? Will there be a backlash against technology in terms of the role of some of the major 
tech players. Uh, we don't know. Let's see how that uh, comes into play. That's what we call a wild card. With regard to the energy transition, the biotech boom, what are some of the the sort of major disruptions that are coming our way. Also there, it's a little bit like a volcano. We know that all of these things are taking place. I think we've seen some of the energy majors now in the oil and gas majors, some of these beginnings of, of major tectonic shifts uh, uh, kicking in. So that's why we, we brought this uh, differentiation to the excellent WEF report, uh, but trying to think more in terms of that decade ahead, uh, in terms of a river, in terms of a volcano. I hope that makes sense. Uh, it does make sense to us, but uh, maybe... <laughs> hopefully uh, to others as well. No, it makes perfect sense to me. So let's hope that in the river there are not too many dams. Uh, yes, indeed. indeed also. <laughs> but we'll talk about some of the dams right now. Perhaps going a little bit um, into detail to conclude, uh, because yeah. we don't want to abuse too much of your valuable no, no, time. No um, perhaps uh, if you could tell us uh, something about the, you already started enlisting some of them, the main macro trends that you have identified yeah. over the next 10 years and also perhaps the main, what you just called wild cards yeah. or disruptions yeah. that you are seeing. Yeah. I'm going to try to be really short because this can go into such a length that everybody will be bored. So all I want to say up front is that all of this information is actually publicly available. Uh, the World Business Council, as you know, Marcel, and I think very similar to the Global Compact all across the world, the work with members is internal, but once it's available, we make it available uh, as publicly as possible. Uh, as I mentioned, we have identified basically six categories of trends and 12 uh, trends overall, so two per uh, category. We've got the, the sort of population, the demographic uh, trend, and there, of course, you're looking at uh, population growth taking place. Uh, we know in particular the areas of, of South Africa and, and Southeast Asia, but we also know of generational uh, divides and also generational uh, issues. Some, of the, some parts of the world getting older, much older, and other parts getting younger. Uh, on the side of the environment, you're looking at uh, sort of a, uh, this river of deterioration almost, if I may say, that you know you really have the climate impacts that are worsening, you really have local pollution levels that are hitting uh, quite extreme uh, levels, and you're looking also at elements of scarcity that are actually creating a drive for innovation, including from the business community. On the side of the uh, economy, you can think uh, about sort of the, the elements of short-termism, uh, in terms of the, the crisis uh, at the level of um, the economic uh, crisis that was sort of outlining itself already way, about, way uh, before the, uh, the, the pandemic. But also you can think about, of course, the rise of certain parts of the world, in particular uh, certain Asian economies, that sort of uh, globalization hitting slowly but surely, maybe, let's say, I shouldn't say slowly but surely, it's peak. Are we sort of reaching peak globalization and are we falling back into some sort of fragmentations? We'll have to see. The fourth major bucket is the area of technology. And there is basically the idea of technology to uh, improve uh, efficiency, improve productivity, but also technology in terms of data. What kind of data is generated for the benefit of who? Uh, the sort of machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, interactions and the wider developments around uh, 5G and all of these things uh, in terms of what it is accelerating in terms of societal and, and, and business uh, change. Uh, and then we have sort of over the last two buckets is the politics and the culture bucket. The politics bucket uh, may be a hot one, but uh, certainly polarization and radicalism uh, not on the decline, to put it very diplomatically, and certainly uh, geopolitical stability also not on the rise. And so some of the uh, major leaders there, uh, of course, um, interfacing uh, in maybe not the most cooperative way right now. And how will that affect the world? It will be interesting uh, to follow over the next few months and, and, and years, and hopefully for the best, not for the, the worst. And last but not least, we call it sort of the culture, um, the culture uh, bucket. It is this idea, and, and it's a little bit more also about uh, consumer culture, the idea of um, um, attitudes changing with regard to ownership. So, you know, you go from an ownership society, are we starting to change maybe in the richer parts of the world at least, uh, the attitudes toward how, what, what owning a product or a service means? Are you more moving into sort of uh, uh, models that are, uh, let's say, more uh, differentiated from the traditional uh, ownership uh, model? But also with regard to culture, and I think we see it in every country, uh, in Germany included, and even in my very quiet and, and uh, 
quite boring country, Switzerland, a little bit more uh, culture wars also with regard to, you know, the role of the state, uh, the inequality agenda, uh, the polarization between uh, rural and urban areas, uh, who's contributing uh, how much to national uh, well-being, uh, which areas are more severely impacted uh, by an economic uh, crisis, unfortunately, uh, right now. And so the, the polarization certainly not easy to manage, easier to manage in countries that have buffers, including financial buffers, but certainly something to watch out for in terms of the macro trends. I know I was a bit long on this one now, but if you want, I can give you just a very, very short overview on the, on the disruptions, the big picture. Is that okay? That would be great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I hope it's, just, it's just many of them to, to list. No, here in terms of, um, we call them wildcards. Wildcards is basically, you know, something that can kick in, uh, but we are aware of. There is data about it, there is information, there is thinking, there are studies about it. Think about the, the financial crisis. Uh, there are cycles, uh, the economic cycles. When is the next uh, financial and economic crisis hitting? It's a matter of time now. It is, it is already kicking in now, but there are wider cycles that need to be kept into uh, the radar of, of planning of companies. Pandemics, I think I mentioned it uh, before. Uh, think about uh, conflicts, certainly something that maybe we started thinking they are sort of uh, slowing down, but uh, major conflicts are certainly on the, at least on the risk map uh, certainly not uh, anymore quite low, but actually uh, rising, unfortunately, uh, with regard to um, their eventuality, their likelihood. Uh, if you look at uh, popular uh, revolt, popular revolt in the face, uh, we have seen protests all across the world with regard uh, to climate. We have seen pop uh, protests across the world with regard to gender. Uh, if you think about uh, popular revolt against possibly the role of technology in our lives, how much are we willing to accept and trade-off between convenience and efficiency and uh, privacy. I know also in, in countries like Germany and Switzerland, uh, a lot of discussion there about the role of technology, even just downloading a simple app uh, around COVID-19 creates a huge controversy. So imagine if we're really moving into the, really the internet of things at, at the real sort of uh, level of what 5G uh, is promising. And then of course, the ideas about uh, the, the, the evolution of the energy system, of, of biotech, uh, with positive consequences, hopefully, but also we don't know the, the unintended consequences there are certain, certainly something to have on the radar. Yeah. Thank you very much, Filippo. That was certainly a very comprehensive overview, and I thought, I'm sure it has created um, a lot of interest among many of our listeners uh, to review the documents that you mentioned that are publicly available on WBCSD site. I can imagine, perhaps as a final comment or question, yeah. that many of these hazards, this, uh, this, this wild card, these potential disruptions, yeah. uh, can generate fear in the population and can be a factor uh, to to drive actually uh, populism, radicalism, yeah. what you mentioned yeah. before. So in that sense, probably having a positive vision of the future also to counteract all these populist yeah. and uh, r radical movements that we are seeing can be an uh, important component. In that way, I think you would probably be inclined to contradict our former chancellor in saying that we don't need this. <laughs> Yeah. No, with the greatest respect to him, I think uh, you alluded to some of the points. What, what our companies have really uh, asked for in a positive way, demanded in a positive way, including our executive committee, was to say there is enough doom and gloom out there. And, and we know the science, we're listening to the science, mm -hmm. we're listening to policymakers, but doom and gloom is not necessarily going to drive a business agenda. I think, uh, think it through as a team in WBCSD with the 40 companies that you're working on. Think through how to create an agenda that you actually want to be part of. That you say, hey, we are all aware of the trends, of the disruptions, of the issues that are at play. They are literally in front of our nose right now, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 crisis. But how do you turn it also into an opportunity, not from a sort of capturing it all, but actually an opportunity to contribute to societal well-being, an opportunity to redefine the role of business, in particular of big business uh, in society, and also an opportunity to enter into a debate with policymakers, with civil society around some of the difficult trade-offs that are lie ahead, lie ahead for business, but also for society with regard to bringing about this transformation. So in that sense, it's more trying to paint not a, a rosy picture of the future on the country, trying to say the direction of travel is clear. There's a lot of road to go. 
and there will be a lot of problems like every year, like every decade. There will be always issues mm. kicking in, but we need to be alert to them. We need to listen to science and we need to think through also in the model I know of the Global Compact of collaboration among various stakeholders. And if we don't do it, uh, nobody else will come forward and do it. So let's do it from the business community side. Let's bring everybody along and actually articulate from the business community side what that means. And usually my experience, and I know Marcel also with your history in WBCSD, when you present that uh, original vision and say, you know, business as usual is not sustainable, at least you start to capture, oh, wow, okay, you're actually acknowledging that there is an issue and, and, and you are actually trying to come up with solutions. And, and it's good to be challenged then on it. And, and we have a plan on how we want to roll it out in order to be challenged. Uh, and I think that will be actually the interesting part of 2021, to be challenged and to engage in those debates with a number of different stakeholders, but saying, look, this is a business view, agree or disagree, but you can keep it also factual in the current polarized time, at least you can keep it at least a little bit factual based on science and on, a, on, a, and on an idea of progress for society. Once again, I would like to thank you for your valuable time and illuminating insights, Filippo. As always, it was a great pleasure talking to you.